Hey there, Ideal Protein Nation around the world. Can you believe it? Two shows, two weeks back to back. Man, it's been uh, a lot of work, but it's been so, so much fun. And as always, I'll start the show by saying I couldn't be more excited about this show. Um, wait till you, you meet the young lady that I've got on today. Uh, hey, I tell you what, let's just uh, introduce the show to people that don't know uh, what's going on. Um, the Life Possible podcast spotlights successful clients, coaches, and clinic owners who have used the Ideal Protein Protocol to transform their lives. These people truly have had life-changing experiences as a result of the program, and now they're pursuing goals and dreams that they thought were dead and gone. They're pursuing goals and dreams that they never thought they could. Some of them are pursuing goals and dreams they never even knew they wanted to. In short, they're living what we like to refer to as life possible. So who am I and why am I doing this? Well, my name is Dr. John Barnes. And I got to tell you, there's no easy way to put this. Uh, six years ago, um, I was fat, sick, and depressed. Uh, I had pretty much given up, uh, let myself lapse into obesity and insulin resistance. I had no idea what happened to my metabolism. And uh, truly, I believe that uh, God answered my prayers both personally and professionally with the Ideal Protein Program. Uh, initially, I lost 45 pounds. It, it totally recharged me and my life and my purpose. Uh, now, uh, I am actually over 70 pounds down from my initial weight, and I am living out my personal life possible by uh, being able to participate in the sport of triathlon again after over 25 years of inactivity. Uh, over the, the pandemic, I found myself with some extra time on my hands, and uh, I decided to go ahead and create this podcast. And we are coming up on the one-year anniversary of my first show. That will actually be next week. I uh, can't even believe that the show would uh, be what it is today when I got this started. So who do we have for you today? Oh, man, we have Rebecca Wilson. Rebecca Wilson happens to be one of Dr. Paul Wilson's daughters who he mentioned during his interview in episode 24 of the Life Possible podcast last month. If you have not watched or listened to uh, Dr. Paul's episode, it is a fantastic show. Love Dr. Paul. I had the chance to meet him a couple of years ago at Dallas. And um, he mentions that both of his daughters were inspired by him and went on their own weight loss journey. I happen to then uh, be contacted by and pursue Rebecca. Um, Rebecca is an actress and educator who lives in New York City. Uh, she struggled with her weight off and on during childhood and adolescence, um, even when she was an athlete in uh, high school in dance and cheerleading, um, and on into college. But then after college, Rebecca seemed to have lost her way and, uh, as an actress, and she thought that her career was pretty much over. Um, she soon became inspired by her father's Ideal Protein, amazing transformation, and she herself has lost over 80 pounds doing the program. As you can imagine, this has re-energized her life and her career. So without further ado, let's meet Rebecca Wilson. Rebecca, hey, come on in. How are you? Hi, I'm great. How are you, Dr. John? I am doing fantastic. I'm so excited uh, for everybody to meet you and hear about your, your life, uh, your stories. First off, tell us where you are today. Um, right now, I am in my apartment <laughs> in uh, uptown Manhattan in New York City. Um, I live in Washington Heights, uh, and, you know, it's a nice day outside. So and it looks I like it. <laughs> So we were talking a little bit earlier, and, and we, we want to mention that uh, if there is some background street noise, <laughs> that this is life in New York, right? Forewarned. <laughs> yep. Yep. No. I, I hope we get to hear a little bit of that, get that ambiance of New York City. I love New York City. <laughs> it's I, I, lo I love to visit. And so again, um, as I found during doing these shows and, and getting friends in different states and cities and countries, um, be on the lookout because I'm gonna come up there sometime. And, okay. and we need to uh, we need to go out. I'll yeah. take my favorite spots. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> That'd be so cool. Yes, yeah, with real people. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I tell you what, let's get into the show because we do have a lot to cover. Yes. Um, 
I want to start off like I do with uh, most of my guests. Take us through your childhood and into adolescence as far as um, thoughts on gaining weight, being concerned about your weight, and or uh, starting to take measures to change your weight and lose weight. Okay. Um, so uh, my battle with weight, I would say, started when I was about eight or nine years old. Um, puberty hit, so uh, I started to gain weight. Um, and, you know, a lot of kids at the school took notice. Uh, <laughs> uh, As they always tend to do, they right? Tend to do. Um, I want to reference Miss Sonia's episode um, no. where, you know, kids can be cruel and they made fun of me uh, for my weight. And, you know, at my school, you know, punching equaled expulsion. So I couldn't really do that. <laughs> but, um, you know, instead I ended up internalizing it um, yep. and it affected my self-esteem. Um, so uh, me and my parents decided, okay, well, let's go with sports. So um, I, you know, got into cheerleading and uh, my father, as much as I love him, you know, society places a lot of ideas about what an athlete should look like and uh, what an athlete is capable of based on their looks. And um, I kind of defied the odds in that way. I was the biggest girl in my class, but I could do everything that everybody else could do. And which that's why I made the squad. Um, so, you know, I, yeah. I was a great, you know, cheerleader and I had a, I had a great career as a cheerleader and, you know, we made it to nationals and we placed. Oh, which is, you know, fantastic. Um, but, you know, as high school came on, you know, I decided to take that a step further and start training as a dancer. Um, so I, I want to, I want to take it back just a little bit. Okay. Uh, you mentioned, you mentioned your father briefly, and this is a, a conversation that we had, um, that I thought was very poignant, right? Um, when you were a cheerleader and during this time, mm -hmm. you got nothing but the support from your parents, right? Yes, my parents were very, very supportive. Um, you know, they they loved the fact that I was being active and that I was in sports and that, you know, I was on a team and on a squad and, you know, we were successful as a team. Um, but there were some reservations as well because, you know, like I said, you know, as, as society puts it, there are, you know, certain stereotypes that come with being a cheerleader um, that you have yeah, to Yeah, and so- popular. But, and you had you had said to me that uh, it wasn't until much later in life that your father actually kind of uh, let you know that that he did have reservations. He was very concerned for you. He didn't want to see you hurt. He didn't want to see you know any of that stuff happen. Uh, he was very extremely proud of you for doing it, but he never let you know that when you were younger, right? No, no, nah. he, yeah. It, it wasn't until I was older where he was like, you know, when I thought about it, you know, I I thought that you know. I was preparing for, you know, what would ha what would happen if you did not make the squad. I was preparing for that, and you know, I ended up surprising him and defying the odds and making the squad. Yeah, that's so awesome. Um, and then you said too, you also you added dance in there. Yes. Uh, so um, I started training outside of school as a dancer. Um, I went to dance classes at my local dance studio. Um, I kind of worked my way up to being an assistant teacher, um, which was really cool. So, um, but as before, you know, being a professional dancer, there are a lot of stereotypes that come along with being a professional dancer where you have to look a certain way because of the optics, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, kind of, you know, defy the optics, even though, you know, to some extent I had enough skill to, do well as a dancer, I did not look the part. Gotcha. We also had a conversation then too. Um, when did you start to, so ev evidently uh, dieting was kind of a, a thing in the house. You were oh, saying. Yeah. Oh, yes. It's funny. Okay. So uh, my mom and I, and, you know, mom, if you're watching, I'm sorry to out us, but <laughs> I was, look, uh, you know, we're telling the truth here, so it's happening. Um, <laughs> like, truth uh, will set you free. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, when, when I was younger, I remember us trying all different types of things. Um, I don't want to out Richard Simmons, but... <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, we even tried sweating to the oldies every morning. I remember distinctly doing that um, every morning before school um, to kind of, you know, get my body training. And even into high school, you know, my dad, uh, you know, hired a personal trainer and we would have, you know, private coaching sessions to get my body mm -hmm. ready as a professional dancer. Um, so mm -hmm. my parents definitely helped me when I was a kid, you know, with my weight issues. It was just that, you know, I, I would lose, you know, some weight here and there, but I would get no smaller than a size eight. That was the small that I was going to get. I was not going to get any smaller. Um, and that was a truth that I had to understand and internalize. And and we talked about one fateful day when you were probably trying to be a bit extreme with your approach to losing weight or to dieting. Um, one Sunday afternoon. Yeah. So um, one Sunday afternoon, uh, we were coming. And this is what age? I was about 12 or 13 years old. Um, we were coming from church. And um, the night before, I had not eaten any dinner. And uh, the, the morning of, I had not eaten any breakfast. So I had skipped about two meals by then. Mm -hmm. um, after church, we um, were going to a brunch spot. We we're going to a diner. Um, and um, I remember feeling woozy and not quite like myself. Um, and, you know, we went inside the diner and we were waiting to be seated um, in the holding area. And one minute, you know, I was up and the next minute I was down on the floor. Oof. I had passed out. Uh, I, I think they call it a syncopede episode. That's a doctor. Yep, syncopede episode, yep. Yes, um, it was a syncopede episode. Like my body did not have any nutrients that was going to keep myself up. So uh, that's what ended up happening. And, you know, that was kind of a breaking point for me. I ended up in the hospital with an IV in my arm. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Wow. It was, very, it, was a, it was a very low moment for me as a child, you know, struggling with my weight so much that I felt that not eating was a solution. Right, right, right. So high school, dance and cheerleading going well. Yeah. And comes time for college. What were your thoughts about college and, and yeah. where did you end up going? So in college, I had really big dreams. Uh, I, I like to count myself as a big dreamer. I get that inspiration from my dad. Yeah. Um, he, uh, uh, if you reference episode 24, he um, referenced being a big dreamer and he, you know, had dreams of being a doctor and he achieved them. So I thought, yeah. you know, if I, if, if he can work hard and he can achieve his dreams, so can I. So I decided that being a professional dancer was my dream. So uh, I, like I said, with my father, I, I hooked up with a personal trainer and I trained my body to get ready for the college dance admission process. So I would be shopped around to different colleges um, and do dance auditions at those colleges. And that would determine if I got into the program. Mm. So um, one of the most prestigious dance programs, um, I'm not really going to mention it here, um, but I got an offer to join the program. I worked really hard to get there. I worked on my technique as a dancer and I made it into the program. And it was a great accomplishment. Me and my father, you know, reveled in that together because he helped me get there. So I got into that program and I, I, I you know, made it. And then, you know, about a couple months in, I realized just how intense this dance program actually was. Yeah, I can't um, even imagine. It, we, we were like a ton of bricks. I mean, dance programs in colleges, in certain colleges, have prestige. So when you graduate from those programs, you get a guaranteed spot in any professional dance company you want. And wow. that's the kind of dance program I was in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, various prestigious dance programs nas nationally and internationally, alumni from those programs were able to make it onto those uh, dance companies yeah. and have a pretty successful dance career. So I was in very, very high level and high expectation 
like that kind of company. That was the company that I was in. And it was very hard and very intense. We danced for about four to five hours a day, including Saturdays and Sundays. We were lucky if we got holidays. There was no time for a social life Um, outside of that. um, Little to no time outside of that for a social life. And it took its toll on me. And I realized that I, I couldn't keep up. So I had to switch gears into acting instead. Yeah. And, you know, again, college is is kind of, it's supposed to be some of the best years of our life. There's all kinds of experiences that we want to have. It's our first time on our own for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, I know that the scholarship athletes and, and again, dance programs, et cetera, it's just so intense. It, it doesn't really feel like college. No, it feels like you're in the professional environment because that's yeah. what they're gearing you up for. They're preparing you for that environment. Yeah. So you decided, okay, that's not for me. Let's shift gears. Let's head into theater and education. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I I decided to change my major to uh, theater education, um, which was a specialized program at the time um, at the school that I was um, at, enrolled at. Um, And I, you know, was no longer training as a dancer. So Mm -hmm. the strict diet that I was on, the strict exercise regimen that I was on, no longer, I thought, applied to me. So I started eating like a regular normal college student, and I started behaving like a regular normal college student. I had a very (laughs) active social life outside of, you know, college, uh, uh, outside of the classroom. And I also ate whatever I wanted. Whatever was in the cafeteria, that's what I ate. So I went from being a size eight and, you know, being at my lowest uh, weight to being about 200 pounds by the time I graduated. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, that, you know, it happens, you know, in college, you know, you gain the freshman 15 and then, you know, for me, it went from freshman 15 to like out of control. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's what ended up happening. Well, and it's it's no wonder because, like you said, you came from from being very restrictive and hard on yourself and and uh, in every aspect of your life, and now suddenly you had the world was your oyster. Yeah. Um, uh, the other thing that you said that that strikes me that is very common for everybody is the cafeteria food. Yes, right? <laughs> yes. There was. I mean, I don't want to out my school, but if you know. Where I'm from, in my school, we have what's called Soul Food Thursdays. There you go. Soul Food Thursdays, all bets were off. Those people in the cafeteria cooked their little butts off. They had everything. They had collard greens and macaroni and cheese and, you know, all the things that were good to you, but not good for you. Not okay. good, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't think that's limited to your school. Oh, you know, I think okay. that's pretty much, pretty much standard fare, you know, and these yeah. days too, yeah. After having three kids go through college and going to their dining experiences, holy cow. I mean, yeah. the, the things that are available to people today, it, yeah. it just absolutely blows your mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, so food Thursdays. Were my weekend, <laughs> so if you guys are out there, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so you went through you went through school now, and you, you grew and grew. You graduated. Mm-hmm. Yes, graduated. Got um, on the day, yes. And so then what? Where? So you've graduated college. What's your yeah. next steps? So um, I decided to dream even bigger. So <laughs> I, I love, but I, I absolutely love this. Right. Um, and I love the fact that your dad kind of inspired you by his, his approach to life, right? Yeah. Dream yeah. big and go after it. Dream and that's, big and go for it. hundred percent. And that's something that you and I have talked about. And that's, that's just kind of been your, your pattern through life. So, okay. Well, the dance dream, man, we'll put that aside. We'll, we'll move on to theater education. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now what could be a dream or what could be the next step that you chase? Broadway, of course. <laughs> so um, after my training um, in the in the BFA program, I decided to go one step further and pursue a master's degree um, in theater 
um, and in education uh, once more, because I mean, education has always been something that was close to my heart. Um, I've been teaching since I was 14 years old. Um, and I loved being able to pass on knowledge that I know to other people. So that's why I kind of tacked on that education bit with the theater. Yeah. Um, and I- Well, and also, I'll also call time out because I think any budding actor or actress um, also understands that they need, they need something else to be doing until they hit it big, right? Oh, yes. Um, I mean, and that's the common misconception, right, about actors and the whole starving artist bit, right? Like, you know, you you have to act, there's no other choice, you know, in acting and, you know, you have to, you know, just, just pursue acting full force, 100%. But there are so many places that you can go in the business that can, that can sustain you mm -hmm. um, until, you know, you get that, you know, one television gig or that one, you know, big theater gig that, you know, makes you quit all the other gigs. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it's a survival technique, especially here in the city. Like you gotta have at least five jobs to be here, you know? Um, so, you know, I, I worked as a teacher. I worked as an acting coach uh, for children, um, for television gigs and stuff like that. that. And, you know, that those are my side gigs. Um, and along with that, I pursued my MFA, um, at a prestigious university and um you know it didn't really matter Wait, so that's your master's yes that's my master's so I, I i got an ma in educational theater um at a prestigious university here sounds like a stressful life um you know juggling these these different wearing these different hats juggling these different yeah. um jobs etc how did you how did you fare with that oh my gosh uh new york city is very fast paced if Nobody else, you know, knows that by now, you know, watch all the television shows that have to do with New York and you'll see. Right. Uh, yeah, New York City moves very fast. So it's also very uh, stressful. Um, it is a high stakes, high stress environment, move fast or get out of the way. That's basically how New York is. Um, and, you know, I had to keep up with that pace, um, but to cope with it, I pretty much ate whatever I wanted. I carried on the habits that I had from undergrad and moved them here to New York. So even though my location changed, my mindset kind of stayed the same. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and, and about this time, you were you were seeking to you were getting roles. Yes. So I mean, I achieved a little bit of success. Um, working as an actor in New York. I pounded the pavement just like every other New York actor. I went to, you know, I, I stood in line at non-equity, fellow actors out there, if you know what I'm talking about. Non-equity means that you're not a part of the actor's union. So if you're not a part of the actor's union, what you would have to do is wake up early in the morning to stand in line so that you can write your name on the list so that you can be seen by casting directors later on in the day. So I woke up, at 5 30 in the morning to put my name on a list so that i could come back and audition so i did that every day uh wow. while wow. i was in school mm -hmm. so during the day i would have my you know acting coaching job you know i, I would wake up in the morning sign my name in in the non neck line i would uh come uh come back in the afternoon do my audition do my acting coaching gig in the afternoon and then take classes at night it was a very wow. intense schedule, okay? So in that, I kind of coped with just eating whatever I could pick up. So in New York City, there's food on every corner. There's like yeah, there is. a mega, there's always a pizza joint. There's always, you know, a deli yep. on every corner. So I just scrounged around for food whenever I could. And also I was a student, so I was eating the student's diet, okay? Yep. So... Uh, that's pretty much how my life was for those two years. And, you know, I ended up gaining another 30 pounds on top of it. Wow. So, okay. You know, that's what ended up happening. And, you know, because of my weight, my roles were very limited. Um, so instead of playing like yeah, I think we got, we a lead role or a love interest, I would be playing the sassy side character, the best friend, the nurse, the teacher, or the mom. 
uh, yeah, I got a lot of nurse roles. That that picture on the right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were talking about that. <laughs> yeah, so um, this is me um, on the set of a television show. Um, I did background work on the side as well uh, to make ends meet. So uh, background actors are basically the actors that fill up the scene in each of the scenes in a television show. So we walk back and forth or we yeah. talk in front of the camera. Um, just to give the illusion that the scene is real. So I did that for a number of years and I'm still doing it now, you know, scrounging. I think that's I think that's amazing. I think that's just a whole lot of it must be a whole lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Um probably not a whole lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. And uh in New York City, I'm sure that there's always there's always projects, right? Oh yeah, there's always something shooting here. Um, especially with the rise of streaming shows. There's always something uh that you can get called in for. Um it's just a matter of being fast enough to get it. <laughs> gotcha. Um, but yeah, like, uh, so I, you know, that, that was one of my gigs being a nurse. And then, you know, I kept getting hired for a nurse and teacher and mom gigs because of the way that I looked. So I looked older than I actually was. So I would gotcha. get for roles that were like 35 and up, even though I was only 20 years old. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, it was kind of frustrating because I tried to be authentically myself as much as possible, but I was not marketable as a young plus size woman at the time. Fortunately, now things have changed significantly. Yeah, you know, and, and it is so neat in our conversations. And I, I started to pick up on that as an actor and actress um, playing parts that are older than you versus playing parts that are younger than you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I guess all of the, uh, all the things that surround that. Um, it's about it's work, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that I guess we don't, I mean, something that, that somebody who's not in theater, not in acting, it, you know, doesn't necessarily, uh, th hasn't thought about up until now, but now I totally get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's funny because you know, I always saw myself as, you know, a young, vibrant person, no matter how old I got. Yep. But unfortunately, because of my optics, because of the way that I looked, because I was heavy, you know, casting directors would look at me and go, you know, you're doing a good job as like a student, but you know, with the way you look, I'm gonna have to, you know, make you the teacher or, you know, the mom in this situation like and i would just be like okay it's happening again yeah. and, you know no matter how hard i pounded the pavement no matter how hard i worked on my skill as an actor those are the roles that i was pigeonholed in those are the roles that i was subjected to yeah part of the motorcycles outside welcome to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, we get the ambiance. I love yeah, it. Yes, yes, love it. Um, so tell us about that picture in the middle. Okay, so the picture in the middle is uh, my commercial model shot. So uh, every uh, commercial model has what's called a comp card. So on that comp card are various pictures of you in different situations along with your headshot. I tried to shop myself around as a commercial model as like a real life person. So they have like types of people that can be seen in commercials. So they have like the model-esque types and then they have, you know, normal looking everyday people who can sell you the product. So I wanted to categorize myself as one of those people. Um, but it was very hard to be shopped around because I was very young, but I was plus size. I looked like somebody's mother, but I wasn't. Yeah. And so that was the conflict that casting directors had with me whenever they would try to cast me for a commercial or for a, a television or a theater role. Um, so it was very frustrating at the time. Um, I kind of, you know, wish that the acting world was different back then. Um, mm -hmm. But now I feel like they've made pretty great strides in terms of body positivity and body acceptance. So they are showing more people who are more diverse in their body type 
as what they actually are. Yeah. Young yeah. people. So they've they've changed since then, but back then it was very difficult for me to sell myself how I was. You know, what I like about that picture though, you can just tell you've you've got that spring in your step, right? I mean, you've yeah. kind of got that that sass, that attitude. Um, you know, you can see in that picture. Uh, I do think that that's really neat. Yeah, and um I was, you know, at my heaviest. I was 230 pounds, but I, you know, there, there's a saying, fake it till you make it, right? So right. I had to like sell that confidence and, you know, portray that on the camera. Yeah. So, I mean, th that that's what that picture en encapsulates for me, me working really hard to build up my confidence and sell myself. Yeah. Yeah. Fake it till you make it. That's kind of what I'm doing with this show. Um, <laughs> Tell us about, so take us to that picture on the left. Where are you? Oh, on the left. Okay, so on the left, I am on vacation with my family in Hawaii. It is shortly after my sister graduated from college. We were just all celebrating our accomplishments as a family. You know, me graduating from grad school, my sister graduating from college, and Paul, like really, my, my brother, Paul, um, oh, gotcha. really making, you know, his way in the world as a high schooler. Um, so we were just all celebrating each other. And at that time, you know, I had that mask on my face that I was happy, you know, as a person and happy with myself. But on the inside, I was not happy at all. Um, there was an instance where my mom decided on family photos during the vacation and she insisted on it. And I was mortified. I did not want to take those pictures because I knew how I looked on the outside, you know, and I I did not have the confidence to be okay with taking those photos. Yeah. So that's, that's something, you know, again, I think a lot of us can identify with that. Yeah. Um, you know, once you get to that point where you just, you don't want to see yourself in photos, yeah. you try to get in the back of any group shots. And mm -hmm. Try to hide your body behind. Look, I've done all the tricks. I've done like the sucking in the gut and squatting down and hiding behind other people. Like I've done that my whole life. Yeah. Uh, even now, like even now I'm kind of uncomfortable in that picture because I can't hide my body. It's a full right. body shot. I can't hide. So, you know, I'm wearing all black, even though it's like 90 degrees outside and sunny in Hawaii, um, you know, yeah. I, I would try all the tricks, you know, but I, it still didn't match how I felt on the inside. So um, this, all of this kind of came to a head for you then, right? Um, yeah. How many years had you been up there and you just kind of decided, you know yeah. what, I, I think I'm done. I think I'm out. Yeah, I reached about my fourth year as an actor, and um, I had been two years out of graduate school, so I was really pursuing an acting career full time. And you know, getting up every morning, going to sign my name, and you know, going for auditions and like pounding the pavement and being told no you can't be a lead role here. Yes, you did a good job, but I can't cast you here because that's not what I see when I look at you. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately that's the nature of the business. Um, while we have made strides in Hollywood and Broadway, um, there's still that idea and that mentality of what certain roles are supposed to look like, certain tropes are supposed to look like. And, you know, I tried to defy the odds like I did in my childhood. You know, I didn't right. look like a cheerleader, but I was. I didn't mm -hmm. look like a professional dancer, but I was. Um, but, you know, it didn't work well in the acting world. It didn't work in the acting world. It didn't matter what my skill level was. What mattered is how I looked. It is the package that you're selling. And look a gotcha. very big part of it. Yeah. So I was just very discouraged. I was, you know, at my lowest point. Um, and I decided to quit acting full time and go into teaching full time. So I'd taken up a job at a preschool. I worked my way up from classroom teacher to um, manager and administrator. Um, 
And, you know, even though I, you know, got this fancy title and I got all this money and, you know, I, you know, was in charge of all these people, I was not happy. No. And you're still up in New York City at the time. I was still up in New York City at the time. Okay. So, you know, I, I made my way up in the education world, but I was not happy at all. So I decided to take a summer and I went to my parents' house. So I decided to stay with my parents and with my dad. And I just saw how amazing he looked. So yeah, so first off, we've got uh, before pictures with you yeah. guys, right? There's that's you and dad. Me, yeah, that's me and my dad at my um, uh, undergrad graduation. Um, and he was at his heaviest, he was 400 pounds. And, you know, we were both overweight at the time. Um, and I could tell that even though my dad was happy that I had graduated, like I could tell in his eyes that he wasn't very happy either. Um, I, I think we were both, both of us in that photo were putting on the smile for the camera, but on the inside, we were both very unhappy. Um, and like, there's a huge difference between that photo on the right and that photo on the left. Yeah. Like, I, I know my dad so well. And that photo on the right is him smiling like he is truly happy because he took control of his health and took control of his life and was able to make that amazing transformation through idea. Well, and, and, and yeah, when you look at those pictures, right? Uh, the man on the right is forcing that smile. Right. Mm -hmm. He's proud of you and he's given you a smile because he's proud of you. But inside he's he's got to kind of push through that. But yeah. that smile, that that smile on him in the other picture is just joy. That's that's right? how my dad actually smiles. We have this yeah. smile. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. It's genuine. His smile is genuine. And that actually was the summer. That picture was taken actually on the summer that I decided to start the ideal protein protocol. Wow. So yeah. take us through that. What what went into this decision? How, you know, oh, wow. you came home and well, when your dad was actually going through the weight loss, you were in New York for most of that, right? Yes. I was in New York for most of that. And I would visit on occasion, like I would come home for, you know, holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, that sort of thing. But every time I saw him, he was like the incredible shrinking man. He would just get smaller, yeah. smaller and smaller. And I'll just be like, oh my gosh, dad, you look amazing. Like, what are you doing? Like, like what you're doing is working so well. Like, what are you doing? He's like, yeah, like I'm just trying this new protocol called Ideal Protein. And when I heard about it, it made perfect sense to me, you know, as a physician, it made perfect sense. Yeah. Um, and you know, he was a, he's a primary care doctor. Yes, he's a primary care physician. So he knows about the body. He knows about nutrients. He knows about nutrition and what the body needs in order to stay at its best and, you know, to be healthy. And, you know, Ido Protein made the most sense to him. Yeah. And, you know, it, he, he, he did the program and, you know, he just transformed right in front of me. Um, and, oh God, I don't want to get Yes. <laughs> so yeah, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm going for tears here. Oh, yeah, um, ready. <laughs> you were telling me a story then. So you came home for the summer and yeah, dad I, I, was yeah. finishing up his transformation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so uh, tell us about these pictures here. So, um, I, my dad realized that I was very unhappy with my weight and we had talked about it at length for a while. Um, cue the sirens. Um, yeah, right. But um, yeah, like we, we had talked about it for a while and I, you know, expressed to him how unhappy I was. And he said, you know what? Why don't you try coming to an Ideal Protein initial seminar just to see if this is something that might be right for you? So me and my sister, Renata, who I love very dearly, um, who was also struggling with her weight at the time, um, both went to the seminar and we didn't know this until we got there, but he was a keynote speaker during the seminar. And you know, I love that you didn't know that. I love that it was I, a surprise. Like me, me and my sister, like we were like, dad is going up there and he's talking to people. Like we don't, because I, I love my dad so much. Hi dad. I love you. But <laughs> 
he is, you know, a, a, a quiet and reserved kind of man until you get to know him and then he opens up. But yeah, yeah, yeah. when he was on, you know, in front of those people at that seminar, I saw the growth in his confidence and how much command he had over the room as a public speaker. He shared his story. He was honest. He was open. And he was, you know, just so inspiring when he talked to everyone. And at the end, he does this, you know, thing with his coat, um, his doctor's coat. So he pulls out his coat that he wore when he was 400 pounds. And I remember him being 400 pounds and being in that coat and it being too tight on him. I remember seeing that as a yeah. teenager. Yeah. And he put that coat on and it looked like his father's bathrobe. And it was yeah. that I started crying very hard. I I was inconsolable. I was boohooing. <laughs> <laughs> just just boohooing, you know. <laughs> I was inconsolable because yeah. I was finally able to see my father in a light where he was finally truly happy with himself. He had done, you know, the internal work with himself and he had made a decision to change his life and to take his health into his own hands. And when he put on that coat, it just, the visualization just sealed it for me. It sealed it for me. He yeah. set that path for himself. And I went, you know what? If he can do this, I can do this too. If my father who has struggled with his weight for longer than I've been alive can do this, so can I. And that's what inspired wow. me and my sister Renata to start the program. Wow. Um, and and his coach at the time, uh, and I'm gonna shout her out, Sally. I'm yeah. gonna her. Sally, if you're listening, hi. Um, she changed my dad's life for the better. And you know, she changed my life as well and the life of my sister. Um, because of her not just coaching us in the protocol, because that's that's one part of the job, right? Coaching yep, yep. call, but she also took stock of our mental well-being. She always asked us how we were doing before we even stepped on the scale. She asked us, "How are you doing? How has yeah. your week been? Like truly and deeply, how has your week been? Mm -hmm. What did you do this week? What kind of what kind of week did you have?" before we even stepped on the scale. Wow, yeah, yeah. And you know, the fact that we had a coach like that really helped us in our transformation because it made us realize that our coach was truly in our corner and that she really cared. She really cared yeah. about us. Yeah, um, I do. I, I tend to find, you know, God puts us in the right places with the right people. And uh, I, I really feel like he had a lot going on. And Sally is a legend in Ideal Protein. Yeah. Um, she's retired now. Yeah. And um, she, uh, you know, again, I just, it couldn't have been a better fit. And, and now you guys are, are carrying on her legacy, really. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I cannot stress enough, and I don't know if any coaches are listening, but I cannot stress enough how important it is to take stock of your client's mental health and well-being along with, you know, tracking their progress in the protocol. Um, I, you know, it, it, it is funny how a lot of people, when they decide to take a fitness or a health journey, really think about their progress on the outside. And they don't necessarily think a lot about what goes on in the inside. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and there's, there's the, you can't, you cannot underscore underestimate what has to happen on the inside if we're going to be successful later. Right. Yeah. That's why I, I, I love the whole, the, the whole new uh, mantra of reset body, reset mind and reset what's possible. Exactly. If you don't reset both of those things, then nothing new is, is ever going to happen. 
And that's why, you know, uh, that's why I started this show is to, to show people that and to showcase people like you and your father. That's great. Yeah. Hey, let's bring up, I, I've got a picture up here of Renata, you guys oh, together. Sister, yes. Yeah, before and after. Yes. So uh, that's my sister. Uh, it was that same summer when we went to Hawaii and, you know. Okay. Okay. Yep. Same the before summer. picture on the left. Mm -hmm, the picture on the left. And um, we were both, you know, struggling with our weight at the time. And, you know, we, uh, we were very proud of her and her accomplishments, but we both also understood where we were health wise, you know, we weren't in the best place, but uh, flash forward to the, to the picture on the right, we were at our brother's graduation. Um, we both are just, living our best lives and we are both very happy and very healthy. Yeah. And like so gorgeous, so amazing. More. Again, look at the smiles. Yes. Mm -hmm. The smiles tell a lot in a photo. And you know, I, you know, I was faking it. I know I was. Um and I, I can't speak for my sister, but there's a definite significance between the my smile on the photo on the left and my smile on the photo on the right. Yeah. A smile says a lot, you know, acting, you know, there, there's this thing in acting called believability mm. where you have to <laughs> truly believe as the actor that this is where you are, whether it's in a, it, it is, it is acting truthfully under imaginary circumstances. That is what acting is being truthful under imaginary circumstances. So even in your imaginary circumstance, you have to truly believe that you are in it. You have to believe that you are in the circumstance. Right, right. Wow. And we go through life acting ourselves. We're all actors. You know, Shakespeare says, you know, all the world's a stage, all the men and women are merely players. He is correct. Yep. You know, we put on a mask all the time. And, you know, with photos, sometimes we can't, we can't hide it. We just, we can't hide it. Yeah. And I know I couldn't in that photo. And, you know, Neither could any of my loved ones in all those other photos. So, yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about your experience going through phase one, going through the okay. protocol. Um, how, how did you find it? As far as was it was it easier? Was it hard? Was it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really funny that you say that because you know I like my my dad and I are very disciplined people. Uh, when it comes to achieving a goal, when we set a goal, we do not stop. We do right. not, you know, sideline it. We we go for it a hundred percent. That's been our yep. motto. Um, and you know, I made sure that I set that goal very clearly, very early in my phase one. Um, not just my number on the scale, mm -hmm. but also how I would be feeling on the inside. And um, yeah. I set that goal to, to, you know, recalibrate how my body processes foods. Um, and that, that's what I wanted to do. And I shared that with Sally and Sally was like, okay, so now that we have this goal, here is the plan. She laid out that plan very succinctly, very like clearly. And I followed that plan to a T. I followed phase one to a T that first time. And, you know, because of that, you know, my body was going through all these changes, you know, ketosis was starting and I, you know, was drinking all this water. I even had my water next to me too. There you go, right? You know, 64 ounces a day. I do not play. Love it. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, like I, I follow that protocol to a T. And because of that, you know, as the months went on, the weight just started f literally falling off my body. Like I would be week after week, I would weigh in either with Sally or without Sally um, via FaceTime because we used to do FaceTime because I would be here in New York. Yep. And um, every week. And and you know what? So let's let's backtrack that a little bit too. What year are we talking about? We're talking about two thousand and. 18, 2018. Yeah. So that's pre-pandemic. So yeah. talk about ahead of her time. 
uh, you know, putting, putting in uh, tools to do coaching that way already. Yeah. Um, just, just fantastic above and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I admire Sally for, you know, doing whatever she could to keep our relationship and to make it work. I mean, and that's like another thing with coaches, you know, she went above, I mean, I guess that's what makes her a legend. You say she's mm -hmm. a legend. She is a legend to me. Um, yep. but that's what made her, you know, a legend and, you know, made her have such successful clients. She went above and beyond what was expected of her. She was like, okay, you'll be in New York and I'll be here, but you know what? We're going to make this work. Do you have FaceTime? I said, yes. Well then, that doesn't stop me from coaching you just because you're going back to New York and living your life doesn't mean I'm going to stop being your coach. So that's what she did. And that what made me, that's what made me successful that first time. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. And we're going to bring up some after pictures. Is. Yeah. Can't fake those smiles. <laughs> no, not at all. And again, a little bit more attitude, a little more confidence, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. I love it. Showing off. Uh, Showing off my hard work um, with the help of the Ideal Protein program. Yes. So, yeah, just absolutely beautiful pictures. Um, I want to move on to I, I had put together. So you you provided me with some fantastic photos. Yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, I put together what I thought was really really cool, and I want to start exploring this now. So you lost all this weight, and mm -hmm. you're feeling a little more confident comfortable and confident in yourself and your abilities. Yeah. Um, and you decided maybe I'm not done with acting yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I, I put together these pictures that kind of show before and after uh, acting roles. Yes. Yes. So those first two photos, I wasn't kidding. I was a nun and then yep. and everything. Um, and then after, you know, uh, uh, this, this one on the right, um, I'm a student in, in period clothing, mind you. So yeah. clothing made in the, in the 1960s, you know, was very straight laced and they had very specific measurements back then. So, you know, I was very worried, you know, because again, like I couldn't see the progress that I had made quite yet. Um, while I was losing the weight. So I didn't know if I would be able to fit into the wardrobe, mm -hmm. but I put on those pants and they fit beautifully. I put on that sweater and that belt and it fit amazingly on my body. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it just gave me that boost of confidence that, you know, my clothes were fitting better and, you know, I was able to, you know, fit the roles that were, more closer to who I actually was. Um, yeah, yeah. And that was for a TV show, right? Yes, yes. That one over there on the right for a television show, um, a, a very famous television show on Amazon Prime um, that is set in the early 1950s and 60s. And it was it was a very, very great opportunity. Um, and, so neat. Yeah, it, was, it was really, and really nice. But, you know, very believable as, as a nun, you know, I went, I, I started uh, life in, in Catholic school. So K through eight, <laughs> actually K through K through high school. But uh, so you, you were a believable nun. However, oh, yeah. nowadays, yeah. I don't. I, so now, oh, here's another really great one. Oh, right? so this is another before and after <laughs> acting yeah. roles. Yeah. So, you know, before I would, you know, on, on the left. Uh, I was in a role that, you know, called for me being at least 30 years old wow. and I was only 20. Yeah. Right. Which, you know, I, I could, you know, because of, you know, my training, I could probably, you know, take on that air of maturity, but, you know, I was 20 at the yeah. time and over on the right which is funny, it's a reverse of the role. So I'm in my mid to late 20s playing a teenager. Yeah, right? <laughs> and that's, that's crazy. Teenager, what my father described, if you reference episode 24, the school of <laughs> what, okay? I fully embraced that role. Uh, it, it was a role I'm that sorry. I before. The school slut, right? What? That's what he you said. Know, 
<laughs> that is that is like one of the most poignant moments in that show. And for me, I, I was loving every second of the story. Oh As a father, he was so proud of you and so excited for you. Is really you could you could hear that coming through. He was so excited about you getting roles or situations and, and different opportunities from what you had had before. He thoroughly understood it. Um, even if, uh, it made him a little uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it, you know, my, my mother wasn't quite comfortable with my new roles, but, <laughs> you know, we, we had to, you know, have a little sit down and be like, look, mom, I was acting. Okay. Right. It's not me. It's my character. Right. Isn't that what you guys my said? Character, okay. <laughs> She's like, what have you been doing No, I, it's just my character. It's, it's fine. Um, I, I was playing a teenager and not only that, but I was playing a love interest. I all of a sudden got the love interest roles. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I was being paired up with, you know, a, a lover kind of, you know, uh, trope. I was, you know, uh -huh. getting roles again, the, the young ingenue roles that I should have gotten in my 20s my early 20s, but was now receiving now that I had lost the weight. And yeah. again, like to me, that kind of speaks to, to how Hollywood portrays people. You know, there are ingenues, you know, that are, you know, plus size, but Hollywood doesn't see it that way. Right. Um, but, you know, I was, you know, it, it wasn't just, you know, a matter of looks for me. It was also a matter of how I felt. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And, and I don't know. I don't know if you've made it to uh, my Ed Reardon interviews, etc. Ed is one of the the best people who talks about this. Um, you cannot underestimate um, the the confidence on every single emotional and and spiritual level that changes inside of you. Uh, you know. When you now, when you now feel like you're able to express your true self. Yeah. Yeah. Because you've done the work on yourself. Yep. Like it, like, and, and that's what I think the IDO protein protocol is in a, in, in, in a sense, it is you working on yourself with the help. Absolutely. Of and in that work that you put in yourself, once you, you know, have achieved your goal, um, it doesn't stop there once you've achieved your goal, but you finally are able to take pride in your work and therefore pride in yourself. Yeah. Um, so, so here, let's do this now. Um, we're going to have a little taste of your character, Tanya. Um, uh, we, we were gracious. We were, we were excited to be able to get some footage. I'm going to go ahead and throw this yeah. video up there. Uh, bear with us. Those of you who are listening and aren't watching. Um, but, but I want you to, to, Focus in um, because it seems like Tanya is is front and center in a lot of these uh, these scenes that we see. She's yeah. got the moves. Um, yeah. So let's let's bring her out.
Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow so is all I have to say out about out that. Your family. I want to shout out to my bear family. Um, if you're listening or watching this, I love you guys. You guys are the greatest. It was that that was just so incredible. So yeah. um yes, you were the young lady in the two-piece green outfit. Yes, I dancing, was dancing dancing center stage. <laughs> yes, uh, I was. Everything you, all out and in the open. Yep. <laughs> you were an angel dressed in, in silver wings. Yes. Right? Slinky tight. silver nightgown. Very slinky. Very slinky and, and a teenager in a in a school outfit. At, yeah. Unbelievable. You have the moves too, right? So, you. <laughs> I, you know, one of the things that your dad said uh, during our interview that again, just uh, being a dad and, and having a daughter myself, it just to hear him talk about how he was so excited that you were able to use then all of your background and all of your training at that point, um, you know, your dance as well as your acting and, and to be able to now feel like you can put all of that to, to the best use. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if it wasn't, I think if it, personally, if it wasn't for the personal experiences that I had gone through, I would not have been able to perform that role to the best of my ability. I, you know, I remember talking with some people at the stage door after I'd finished my performance and they said, you know, we thought that you were, you know, 17. Like, how old are you? <laughs> are you? And I would go, you'll never know. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's again, it's that believability factor, right? Yeah. As an actor, you have to truly and deeply believe that this is who you are and this imaginary circumstance. And because of my weight loss, I was able to fully embrace this character as she was and play her in that way. Yeah. You know, this this brings us to something we had a great discussion on, and I, I think that people will find this valuable. Um, you talk to me very much about acting as your craft. Yeah. And, uh, you know, literally, quite literally, how your body is your instrument. Yeah. And so going through this metamorphosis, going through this transformation, it just seems to me like the real you was hiding inside and, and could not, uh, you, you couldn't perform your craft the way you wanted to. Yeah. And this kind of released that and allowed you to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Truly and deeply because, you know, a lot of people have misconceptions about acting and actors. Um, people say, oh, well, you know, you just want to be famous yada yada but you know for those people who truly love the craft of acting who truly love delving deep into the human psyche and the human element and being able to recreate that either on screen or on stage um it, it is truly an amazing experience that's why i'm so passionate about it um and i see it as the work. It is the work. It is the craft that I'm doing. Um, and, you know, you can't do your craft without your tools, right? Yep. Every yep. craftsman has their tools, right? A blacksmith has a giant hammer and an anvil, you know, a carpenter has his, you know, chisel and a sculptor has his, you know, hands and his, his chisel and yep. whatnot. As an actor, you are a craftsman. So you're entire body from head to toe is your instrument. You are, you know, from, from your head down to your toes, down to your fingertips. When you are in a role, your job is to make sure that you are fully invested in the role that you're given. So mm -hmm. your if your body is not performing at its best, then it's going to be more difficult for you to do your craft. It's like having a dull, uh, a dull chisel, or having a, uh, mm -hmm. a, 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 a a smaller hammer. You know, it it's it's not going. It, it it may get some of the work done, but it's not gonna satisfy you. It's not gonna be your best work, if that makes. Well, sense. and again, I I also kind of feel like there are certain roles and characters that you will see come up 
and you'll think, oh my gosh, I just, I want to play that. That is, oh, I would love to do that. Yeah, but if you don't have the proper instrument for it, then you can't do that. And, yeah. you know, I can see that during your, your burnout period, et cetera, you, know, you, you kind of had to settle for roles instead of um, going after the ones that you, you really wanted, right? Yeah. Um, another story that we talk, I feel, needs to be told is the story of how you auditioned for that bear show, um, because I found it fascinating that you went in there going after an easy, I know I can do this, this is just, uh, you know, I'm a shoe-in well, role, and instead, something happened, and, and you were shocked. Tell yeah. me about that. Tell tell our listeners about that. Yeah. So um, my very best friends, if they're watching this, they know exactly what I'm talking about. So I went into the audition room thinking that I was going to get the teacher nun role because those were the roles that were on my resume. And those were the roles that I normally went for. And those are the roles that I was mo the most comfortable with. And... I don't know what it was about the directors and the producers of that show, shout out to them, but they saw me as somebody completely different. They called me in for the love interest role. They called me for, they, they called me back in for, you know, the student role instead of the teacher nun role. And I was thoroughly confused. I was very confused. I was like, you see my resume, right? All you see is Mr. So and So. Well, All yeah, you, you told me that you did your best to get that nun role, right? I did. From, I did from what you role. wore to how you, what well, you sang. I so I, I showed up in a black dress, in a long floor length black dress. I sang, a, uh, I had to sing, well, in, in musical theater auditions, you have to sing 32 bars of a musical theater song. Um, and I sung a song from Sister Act, the musical. I spelled <laughs> it out for them. I spelled it out for them. None, 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 make me right. Eat. Okay. Right. And they saw that and they were like, nah. <laughs> yeah, this doesn't fit. They were saying no to the too, nut, okay? And too much confidence, too much vibrance, too much life. <laughs> yeah, way too much. You you have way too much. And like you don't look, you don't look that old. You don't look, you don't look the part. You don't look the part. I'm sorry. But this time, you don't look the part of the nun. You don't look that part anymore. You're not that person anymore. So they gave me the student role, and I was shocked. I was shocked. And what a student role it was. Yes. And I was, I, I was shocked to the point where I was in tears. I, I remember talking with my friends about it the night before we got our call back. And you know, knowing that I had, got, I had gotten called back for a love interest role, I was in tears. I said, I had never seen myself as somebody on stage who was worthy of being a love interest in anybody's life. And I didn't see that in myself in real life, to be honest. Um, you know, as young girls, we're conditioned that if you look a certain way, you're deserving of love and attention. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I spent my whole life internalizing the fact that I wasn't going to get the attention because of the way that I looked. Um, and it was, it was very disheartening for me. So then when I was given that role, it was a shock to me. I, I said, how? That's so how great. Do you that inside me. So, and so then you were, that was the first of many, right? So yeah. we, we talked about then as an actress, uh, so you get cast in a role yeah. and then the next person that you get to meet is someone from costume <laughs> and you used to love that, didn't you? I did. I did. <laughs> um, and you know, it's funny, like once you get one role, it just like, it comes in, in waves and in cycles. So once I got that one role um, as, as a student and as a love interest, many other love interest offers came to the table. Um, to, the, to the left, I, you know, there, there's a picture of me to the left in a slinky red dress. And I, you know, and I, I just told you this story before we started recording. Yeah. I had a story about the red dress. The, 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 the director 
gave me this red dress and said, here, this is your dress. And I argued with her. <laughs> I said, there's no way I can fit into this dress. I'm way too big for this dress. I can't fit in this dress. I go in the bathroom, I put on the dress, it fits like a glove and I'm boohooing in tears. I didn't think I could fit a dress like that yeah. so well. And you know, it, it's different how you see yourself after your transformation. Yeah. A yep. whole other mental, you know, uh, mental check-in that you have to do with yourself even after your transformation. But yeah, you have yes. to do before and during, but you got to check yourself after. You know? Yeah, it's 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 a big deal for a lot for everybody, really. Yeah. Um, I, I would think that. It was it's it was really neat for you, I think, because uh, being in your profession, you had other people who already were seeing you differently, and people who had never seen you before. That's the other part that I think is also fascinating. Is yeah, you know, people that had not been exposed to you as an actress yet, and then you you walk in off the street, and they just you know, well, why the hell would she ever go for the nun? She should have gone for this role. What's what's the disconnect there, right? Yeah, they didn't. They 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 did not see me as the nun. They were like, why? Why are you singing this? <laughs> yeah. Why are you dressed like this? I don't understand. Um, but once I got called back, I changed my outfit. Okay, I didn't wear that long black dress anymore. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then there's there's you on the right hand side. That's a picture of you actually playing the role of a teacher, which I think yeah. you could probably play pretty well. And I and I am the I am the role of the teacher here, but instead of being that, you know older, you know, overweight, like stereotypical ideal of what a teacher is. I am playing a young, vibrant, you know, teacher, you know, with lots of ideas. And I, you know, I get more lines and I get more, I, I get to support the, the main character more. Um, and, you know, those roles kind of pretty much defined the, the rest of my career, the trajectory of my career. Like even now, like right now I'm in production um, for this, uh, you know, project where I am a love interest and I am the lead. Wow. I've never oh. been the lead before. Oh my God. But Congratulations. I just saw something in me and I became the lead. Um, and it happened to me, um, right before the pandemic, like I, wow. I was cast in a role where I was the lead that I, I thought that that was just, you know, some pipe dream, you right. know, right. that I would be a lead, but I got to be the main love interest. I got to be the lead role and I credit, um, I'm going to name her because she changed my life. Her name is Janice Legata, and she changed my life. She cast me as Olivia Pope in a parodied version of Scandal, the television show that was on ABC um, that okay. starred Carrie Washington. And I got to play Carrie Washington's part. Yeah. I was like, what? Oh. Carrie oh. Washington is an actress I've looked up to forever. Oh, and wow. Oh, I my God. I got her part. I can't even imagine. That's so cool. It was unreal. It was unreal. And you know, until the pandemic happened, you know, I I believe that I was living, you know, I was I was getting closer and closer to my wildest dreams. I was yeah. being cast as a lead role in a production and it could only get better from there. Um and then the pandemic hit and then Broadway shut down. <laughs> oh my god so oh. you know broadway and off broadway shut down immediately um and i was very sad and disheartened i can't even i can't even imagine i mean devastation probably doesn't even oh. scratch the surface of that and i'm pretty sure thousands of other actors out there un remember that day and remember what it was like when the when the lights were shut off and everyone sure. was you know everybody was saddened because you know a lot of actors here their bread and butter is their broadway gig or their off broadway mm. gig that's how they make their living and yeah. unfortunately because of the pandemic we were all affected yeah. um and you know, no matter what level we were on, whether we were Broadway or off Broadway. 
So it, it really affected us all, especially here in New York. Um, and uh, th that's what happened. And when the pandemic happened, I was very sad. And yep. you know, the global pandemic affected us all. And, you know, everybody processes things in different ways. And, you know, one person would be like, well, you know, I'm not going to stop doing what I'm doing because of the pandemic. I'm not going to stop working on myself and, you know, achieving my goals because of the pandemic. But then there are other people who, you know, it, it affects them a little bit more deeply. And that's what happened to me. Like I had just gotten my first lead ever. Yep. Yep. And a global pandemic just snatched it away. And I, you know, went off course for a while. I veered off course and I had gained 20 pounds during the pandemic. Um, and it was, it was devastating. Um, yeah. three pictures, you know, are kind of like the, the, the before and after pandemic. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kind of going a little bit in the, a little bit in the opposite direction. Pandemic. Yeah. Right? So like those two photos were before the pandemic. Um, yeah. I was, you know, at my best, performing at my best. I was on protocol. I was at in phase three. So back then there were three phases. So I was in phase three at the time. Um, and, you know, I was living my best life. I was playing a, 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 a Hogwarts student um, from Harry Potter. Yeah. And um, in the middle there, I played a prison guard and I was one of two female prison guards. And the requirement was that you had to fit the uniform and I fit the uniform. So I got the gig. I'm going to um, say you didn't fit it because it looks like it's way too big. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> a little bit, maybe a little bit, <laughs> maybe a little bit, maybe, maybe it was a little bit too big on me. Um, but yeah, like you, the requirement was you had to fit the uniform. So yeah, um, it, it was that. And then to your right is my body post pandemic. Um, I had gained back a little bit of my weight and um, I decided to, you know, get back on the horse um, after I'd taken a couple of months to do some self-reflection. I decided to get back on the horse and go in for a tune-up. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, my dad and I have this new coach. Um, I can name her. It's fine. She said it's yeah. okay. Um, her name you is should. Stephanie. Shout out to Stephanie Krex down in Waldorf, Maryland. Hi, Stephanie. Um, she is my new coach and she's my dad's new coach. And um, she got me back on track. She saw, you know, the effect that the pandemic had on me. And she was like, you know what? There is no room for judgment here. This was a global pandemic. It happened. Okay. It affected us all. So that, you know, that shouldn't stop you though from doing that work on yourself and getting back on protocol. So that's yeah. what I did. I got back on protocol and, you know, I, I lost another 20 pounds and I kind of see this kind of uh, process as like a pendulum, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when you first start with idle protein, your weight does go down, but you know, post phase Three, when you get into phase four, when you get into the maintenance days, sometimes you do gain a little bit of weight, but you can always bring yourself back down. It's like a pendulum. Sally told me, you know, and showed me that weight loss is kind of like a pendulum. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not like yep. straight down and you stay there. Yep. It's a pendulum. You're always constantly fighting against what your body naturally wants to do, which is gain weight. Yep. But you can always bring yourself back down because of the tools that you set in place for yourself. Um, and not just through ideal protein, but also in, in, your, in your mental health as well. You go, okay, I went off course, but guess what? I gotta bring myself back. Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah I love I love when you were talking to me about that model. It, it, it yeah. is so you know, I did it, everybody does it, and, and that's kind of your maintenance journey yeah. is is to get that pendulum to to stop swinging so far necessarily on either side. Yeah. And uh, you know, you've done a wonderful job with this 
And, and that's the thing too. That's the beauty of the protocol. You know, we always try to teach and we try to coach the, the protocol, the phase one weight loss protocol really needs to be kept pristine. It needs to be used as a tool that we invoke when it is that we need to lose a, a certain amount of weight. Um, it's not something that we live in. It's not something that we try to stretch out as far as we can and, and do phase one and a half and phase two forever. Yeah. It, that's not how it works. It needs to be used as a weight loss tool that is invoked when we need to do that. And uh, that's when it's very effective. And, and as we can see, the results were very effective again. Um, you, you see them again. You're just super confident, super happy. Yeah. And well, so that said, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious, I know that our listeners and viewers are super curious too. So yeah. what's next? Have, has that role kind of relaunched and redeveloped for you? Yeah. Are we moving forward or? Yeah. So, you know, the pandemic is a very funny thing um, because now in the business, a lot of auditions uh, depend on self tapes. So oh, wow, I'm yeah. doing every week, a couple of times a week, I do self tapes and, you know, I am still working on my craft as an actor. I'm in class all the time. Um, and, you know, I get feedback from casting directors and, you know, agents and managers and directors, and I am not stopping my craft because of this this global pandemic i you know yes i'm taking all the precautions that i need to take i'm fully vaccinated um now um because i was a teacher so i got the the early mm -hmm. so i was very fortunate that way yeah um but i am not stopping whatever i need to do i will do it um in terms of you know making sure that I am seen and heard by the right people. And, you know, I, I get the roles that I believe that I deserve um, based on my work. Yeah. Yeah. How about, how about this role and uh, the scandal role? How about the lead? <sighs> the scandal role. Yeah. Is it yeah. over or is it? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately uh, right now, uh, Scandusical is on, you know, I would say, you know, Scandusical is not happening, but um, I was called in for a role where um, I was the main love interest. So right now we're in workshops uh, for for that particular um, project. Um, it is a theater project um, that I think might also become a film project, which is really nice. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I'm really looking forward to it. It is like literally the title character. Like, so my character's name is the title of the show. Oh, um, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been cast in this role and, you know, I have nobody else to thank but God. Yeah, and, right. And you know, the people that he's put in my life, including my father and my coaches and you too. You too, Dr. Oh. Um, uh. Because, you know, you never know how a person can affect your life um, until you take stock of it. And, yep. you know, I was put in these positions and in these situations so that I could have a story to tell so that whoever is out there who is young but struggling with their weight and really trying to figure out what can work for them and what options are out there, give Ideal Protein a try, just try it, you know? It worked for me. Yeah. It did. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I truly think that there are gonna be so many uh, young women who are gonna identify with your story, who are gonna be inspired by you. And uh, it, to me, as we've been talking, it just, it seems like there's such a, uh, uh, there's such a place for ideal protein in the theater and acting world, you oh, know, yeah. and in Hollywood. I just, yeah. it, it kind of seems like those two, those two things need to, to cross paths because people can transform themselves pretty dramatically. And some people do, they have to for different yeah. roles, right? Yeah, that's so what a tool ideal protein could be for actors and actresses. Um, there's yeah, some way that we can figure out, way, you know, because yes, exactly. Cause there's whole, way too many, 
There are way too many fad diets out there, right? Yep. We can talk yep. about those all day. You know, cayenne yep. pepper and lemon. I even tried that. It didn't work <laughs> really well. It's not. It's not very good. It's not a very good drink. It's, it's disgusting. Um, I or bet. You know, the grapefruit or the, and the watermelon diet. Like no. Yep. Mm, yep. You know, if all you're eating is grapefruit, there's no other nutrients for you. But with Ido Protein, you're able to get the nutrients as well as being able to lose the weight. So. Yeah. You can lose the weight, but also not put your body in danger. Yeah, or, do it do it in a healthy way, the fastest yeah. and and most effective, healthiest approach yeah. to to losing that weight. And yeah, uh, yeah fantastic. Oh, Rebecca, thank you so so much. Um, thank, you. thank you for all the time that you've spent with me. Like I said, I can't wait to visit New York City. Yes. Um, you know, I've got to see New York City uh, according to Rebecca. Yes. Uh, I think that would be fascinating. Yes. Um, it's an adventure. I'm hoping that our listeners and our viewers uh, don't even know the fact that uh, my office experienced a uh, power surge and blackout in yes. the middle of this show. Yep. And I'm hoping that my editing capabilities have, have sewn it so seamlessly that they had no idea till now. Um, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you for uh, you know for bearing with me through that. It's it's super embarrassing as, no, as uh, no. somebody no, who's trying no, to produce no, a show with somebody who's in the industry, right? <laughs> no, we, we are we are flexible that way. There are times when things get delayed all the time in the acting world, and I am perfect. Yeah, but I hear I hear there's a really great uh, blooper role and outtake role that I I haven't oh, seen no. yet, so I I can't wait to see that part of it. Oh, no. um, but Rebecca, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to bring this to a close and uh, we'll talk to you later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. for. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us for this show. Um, I, I truly hope that, that her story resonates with you and, and helps inspire people, uh, young ladies, especially who have, who have been struggling and had so many issues um, to, to try the ideal protein protocol. Um, no matter where you are in the world, in the country, I invite you to go to uh, the corporate website, www.idealprotein.com, to the clinic locator to find a clinic near you. Uh, if you're in the Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C. area, Barnes Chiropractic Health and Fitness in Centerville, Virginia is my clinic. We would love to help you along your way uh, to, to find life possible. Um, so I am going on vacation next week, but don't you worry. Uh, the next show is already in the works. It's going to be an incredible show. It's going to be groundbreaking, something that we haven't done yet before. Uh, I will tease the show and tell you that we are bringing back one of my favorite, favorite guests of all time, Wendy White Stevens. Uh, this is Wendy's brainchild, and uh, she's been doing incredible work in Texas, and we want to highlight what's been going on there. So we're going to work on this show, and we're going to bring it to you in two weeks. So uh, until then, uh, keep pursuing your life possible.